Right, so for the talk today, I wanted to talk just very quickly about myself to start off with, give you a little introduction to who I am, and then give you just a very quick background to the, our department at York, and to focus in the talk really on the policies that we've used for supporting promotion. So I'll tell you a bit about our promotion cycle, then also how we've addressed part-time working and research leave, and tell you a little bit about how we particularly support our research staff. So um, just to give you a flavour, I suppose, I've been at York for a very long time, probably longer than I really would like to think about. First as a postdoctoral fellow, and then following on from that, I had two research fellowships. So, so first a Royal Society Research Fellowship, and then subsequently an ERC, Starting Independent Research Fellowship. So um, I came off that fellowship into a senior lecturer position for a couple of years, and then was promoted through reader and now into professor. And um, yeah, I guess I guess at the top of the page here, the, the pictures here. So the one is of Yale University, and that was where I did my PhD. So in a sense, perhaps with my career, I sort of did my mobility earlier on in my career um, before sort of arriving at York, and I think then being able to really settle here. So you can see at the bottom here is a picture of me um, with my three children, and um, yeah, they're quite a bit bigger actually now than this picture, but it's quite a nice picture, so I like sharing it. Um, and I suppose it's just to say really that, that I have had three periods of maternity leave and I've worked flexibly and part-time um, around those as well. So yeah, so chemistry at York, I suppose we're pretty typical of a physical, a physical sciences department. And what I'm sharing with you here is a plot of um, the chemistry pipeline. So this is really just a very easy graphic that illustrates what happens to the balance between males and females uh, working across an academic discipline through the, the typical career structure. So you can see here along the bottom axis of the plot, you have um, the, the typical sort of career progression. So from undergraduate through to master's PhD, then postdoctoral researchers up into academics and then professorial. And so you can see here that we start off with, you know, an a fairly balanced picture in chemistry for our undergraduates and master's students. But then subsequently, the number of females working drops off. Um, and that, so the two lines that you can see on this plot, the solid lines are the most recent data. So that was from 2014. The dashed lines are from 2004. So really the extent of the scissors in the plot, the more, the bigger the scissors is open, the worse the situation is in terms of gender progression. The worse the pipeline is, the more females are falling away as you move through. And you can see that things have got a little bit better as, you've, as we've gone here from 2004 to 2014, but um, not, not perhaps as much as we would like to see. And of course, what this represents is, it's not simply a, a plot. It really is a loss of talent as you move through there. You're losing individuals who are highly trained, highly skilled. So on this plot, then, this is our York chemistry pipeline. And I have to say, this is a plot from our most recent Athena Swan submission. So that's particularly why we've got 2008 on this, 2018 on this plot. Um, but anyway, it does give you a flavor of um, the situation in our department. So you can see here that um, once again, things are fairly balanced as we go from undergraduate through to masters. The really nice thing for us is that we're not seeing a fall off um, for our PhD students. And in fact, now in 2018, this was pretty much keeping up at the researcher level, our postdoctoral level, level as well. In fact, we had a bit of a jump up. So our, our lecturers were 50-50 um, female and male. Uh, so it's actually slightly outshot, but it's because the numbers are fairly small. Then we're still seeing a fall off towards um, the senior grade, senior lecturer, reader and professor, but, but much less so than in the national picture. And I think for an update here, so in 2020, um, we've improved the situation again. Our percentage female of professors is now around 24%. So, so we're up to here. So, so, you know, that's a situation that we're very pleased with, but you know, it does take time to, to initiate these changes. And I thought you might just like to see some of the faces behind uh, those bar graphs. And we ha really do have, you know, many female staff now in our department who, who have incredibly successful careers. Um, at the top here, two fellows of the Royal Society, Professor Lucy Carpenter and Prof Professor Pratiba Guy. And um, I think another thing it's really nice to flag is that both Lucy Carpenter and Kirsty Penkman, who can, you can see here at the bottom, one of our chemistry laureates um, actually this year, uh, have worked part-time 
um, for, you know, for a number of years uh, around caring responsibilities. So how have we gone about doing this? Well, um, we're very much believers in uh, good practice being something that should apply to everyone. So we don't particularly just focus on the women in the department. We really aim to develop policies around promotion and career development that are available to all the staff in the department. I think this is a really important point um, and with everything to be very much as transparent as possible. So um, I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about really the process of promotion in our department and the steps that we've put in place to sort of support staff through that process. One of the key things that we do is to have an annual mandatory performance review. Um, and that, that is something I know which can happen in many departments, but really for us in chemistry at York, this is mandatory. We have 100% compliance with the scheme. So this means that all staff in the department will have a discussion with their line manager about how their career has developed over the previous year. And we explicitly include a section in that, um, in that performance review about promotion. So this means there is a discussion for all staff members about promotion every year. On top of that, we also run an annual promotion seminar. So that's something that's given by either the head of department or deputy head of department and is open to all members of the department. So all the researchers and academic staff can attend. And at the seminar, there will be some sharing of perhaps typical benchmarks that people have achieved in, you know, being promoted to different categories. So, so that's a way of trying to really make the process as, uh, you know, as transparent as possible. We, we have um, these days a bank of promotion applications that are available to view and we keep these, they're sort of held by our diversity officer on a Google Drive, but any staff member can request to see those. So that, that has two purposes really, one just to allow people to see what goes into a promotion application, but also perhaps to save time for some members of staff. So, you know, this can be particularly onerous. It's a big process to go through promotion. So it's quite helpful if you're part-time working to have a good model application to work from. Then following on from this, uh, anybody who would like to go for a promotion is able to submit a CV to a working group. So there's a committee that looks at these. This isn't something that's just done by a head of the department. And the committee will then give advice and feedback um, to recommend whether an individual is ready to go for promotion or maybe you know to highlight some areas that could be improved then going on from that there really is further advice offered all through the process so we we've been quite successful at getting part-time staff promoted i would say this is really we have many staff who work part-time in our department and so it's essential of course that those staff can be promoted and of course, perhaps, perhaps it's obvious, but it still is worth saying, you have to focus very much on quality, not quantity. And that should always be the, the main sort of goal, if you like, in putting together a promotion application. We've been careful to really take into account a full range of tasks that the individual contributes, so both across admin and also service outside of the department. We have a workload model that ensures that our part-time staff are not overloaded. And really, the head of department has to be very involved in the process. I think that's would be my key thing that I'd say to you, really. You, you must have a head of department who's on board with supporting staff, you know, who are applying for promotion. So um, I just thought I'd highlight this year, really, with this quote um, that, that was part of our theme, this one submission. Um, and it's really to say that although we have had many female staff who've been promoted, um, who were part-time, this is something that you really cannot take for granted. And the hard in writing a letter of support really does not need to flag up the way in which, you know, perhaps um, that staff member's output might be, you know, might have been reduced through their part-time working. And in doing that, we've been able to, to really also lobby our university and it's changed its practice now so so now at york it's common that or not just common it's required that the commit the promotion committee automatically takes into account whether an individual has worked part-time so um i was also just asked to mention something about research leave so we do have um, a system of research leave in our department and um, th this gives you basically a term or two terms of research leave where you get remission of all of your admin duties and also most of your teaching duties. 
So this is something that does allow individuals perhaps to work on bigger grants or important publications without having so many distractions. And I think, I think again, perhaps the big thing I'd flag here is that the applications for research leave are, are considered by a committee. So we very much always try to do that in our department. Decisions aren't made by the head of department on his own, but, but a committee will look at those applications to ensure fairness and transparency around that. Yeah, and then I think just to kind of finish off really, I thought it was worth saying a little bit about promotion of our research staff. We, we do invest quite a lot of resource in supporting our postdoctoral researchers in chemistry at York. Um, you can probably just see here, this is Leonie Jones, who's our equality and diversity officer in the department, and she's also has a careers role, and she works very closely one-on-one -on -one with our postdoctoral researchers to develop their their CVs, you know, to, to kind of tell them about opportunities for developing their academic profile for applying for jobs. Um, and you can see here some of the activities. I'm not going to run through everything because of the time constraints. There's one thing at the bottom I'll just flag very quickly, and that's that we noticed there were um, really a lack of female staff applying to go through promotion from grade six to grade seven for our researchers. Um, and so to address that, we put a small committee in place to review um, potential CVs, uh, potential people who wanted to apply for a promotion. Um, and that was quite successful in encouraging applications in the subsequent years. So sometimes you can target very directly. Right. So um, just finally, I wanted to very quickly say something about embedding intersectionality. And this is something that... Um, yeah, sorry, I'm just looking, just checking that I haven't got a, a thing about the timing. So our uh, Athena Swan um, can working group, if you like, in chemistry at York doesn't just work on Athena Swan. Athena Swan is, is dealt with as part of the broader equality and diversity remit. So this means that we do have sort of oversight into other areas of equality and diversity. And that's very much something that we actively work on all of the time. And so um, the remit of this group has broadened some years ago, I think back probably about eight years ago now, to include um, disability and mental health, um, LGBTQ plus individuals, and also BAME and internationality. And I think for us, um, it, with, with respect to BAME individuals, that's something that's really a very active area for us. Um, I'm happy to answer questions on that, um, if people would like. So I've now got a screen that's frozen here. I can see again. Um, oh, that's interesting. Caroline, um, yeah, I'm not sure. I, just in terms of, is it is it sort of a sign that um, you know I've got quite a lot of questions actually that have come through? Yeah, no, it's good to have time for questions. I was just coming to an end actually. I had yeah. one. There we go. I'll skip over our LGBT. I'll step back. Okay, let you finish your presentation. And I'll just finish here. I'll leave this up as I finish, really, because, yeah, I just had my acknowledgement slide after this, just to show that it does it work, really. And I think that the top box says it all in a sense. So our promotion practice is led to um, men and women applying at the same rate. So, so that's, I think, you know, that's the proof of the pudding, if you want to <laughs> use, use a phrase like that about it. But... Um, Thank you very much for your attention. And I'll just flag up again to thank my co-workers. This is some of the committee um, in the department. So this is Leonie, who's our careers and um, diversity officer. Thank you. Caroline, thank you very much. Um, it, what strikes me about what, what you've done is that it's just so, it's, it's so hands-on in the school as opposed to, you know, somewhere else, the EDI unit or, or institutionally. Um, you know, we've got a lot of questions questions so I think that's great you know in terms of I mean it, there's a lot of practical examples that you've given there um, I might just go I might just go through some of them Caroline if that's okay absolutely so, um, go ahead yeah great. Um, do you have any tips um, on how to get buy-in for the introduction of research leave um well I think for us in the department then it would be part of a discussion with the whole of the academic staff and I think that's how how we tend to look at it so people are happy to kind of take some responsibilities for you know for other colleagues because they know they'll have an opportunity to have a research leave themselves over a number of years it's it, of course it's been something there have been sabbaticals in the department for some time but I think like many things in academia it wasn't really transparent who got a sabbatical when and so by putting it into a kind of a slightly more formal process where there's a, a date each year when people can apply by 
that really made it better. So staff do keep their, they keep their lecturing. We, we don't lecture too much, I think, in, in our department. But, um, but I think because we're a big department, maybe that helps. So, you know, if a few staff members take on a couple of extra tutorials that we do have the slack for that. I think it's much harder if you're in a smaller department. But I, I think if you're interested in that, I would just recommend, you know, gathering the academic staff together and having a discussion around it and seeing, you know, if members of staff are willing to support it. Um, does this a question here, Caroline? It kind of, I, I quite like it. It's quite a practical one. Um, mm. Do you have any more tips on how schools can practically support staff going for promotions? Like one thing that jumped out to me in your presentation is that you have um, a working group that reviews the applications. Um, I know mm. in UCD, it's the head of school that will look at that. So just, just in terms of maybe, you know, what sort of tips you might have in terms of the supports around promotions? Yeah, I think it's very important to have a working group or a, I mean, it's actually called our promotions committee in chemistry and there are six or seven staff who sit on that. So our, um, our admin manager, our HR manager in the department sits on it as well as a mixture of academic staff and then, you know, and they're taken across grades. If, you, if this is just done by the head of department, I think it can lead to, what should I say? I'll, I'll say some resentment. And I think that's, that's not something that we've seen in our department because we've always had a committee. That's, that's gone on for 20 years that there's been a committee and there's been this process of actually filtering applications. But for colleagues in other departments at York, I know it's common practice that just the head of department would be the one reviewing the applications. And, you know, I hear a lot of mutterings around that. I think it does lead to people feeling they're being singled out for different reasons. So um, I think that it's not a huge amount of effort to, to form one of those committees in that it's just once a year that they're looking at applications. Um, it's really worthwhile, I think, yeah, in terms of something to invest some time into. Okay, um, just in terms of, you, you did mention in the presentation as well about um, men and women applying at the same rate. There's a question here, um, is success defined by men and women applying at the same rate uh, rather than looking at outcomes? Um, yeah, I think we'd be very concerned if the outcomes were very different from the two groups. In fact, women do slightly better than men in our department currently, and that's, that's probably something you expect. There's probably... A slight time lag sometimes in terms of how long um, it takes women to go for promotion and of course that's probably as, as you'd expect it there, there are still more women who work part-time than men who work part-time we do have some part-time working academic male staff including one who's a professor uh, so it's not just women who work part-time but there are more women working part-time so I think that's probably what's feeding through but the, no you're absolutely right if the women weren't being promoted when they went for promotion um, that that would be a real concern. In fact, with, with having the committee and the, the vetting of the applications, um, they're pretty good at knowing who to recommend. And we have a very high percentage of the staff who go forward for promotion are promoted. Okay, and I mean, it, it, it strikes me as well that, um, you know, you, you seem to have a very, a very big focus on, on part-time, which is great, you know, in, in the sense that, um, you know, obviously, you know, you, you give due recognition to that through your promotions uh, procedures. There's a question here. Um, before mm -hmm. starting with the Athena Swan process, was it common for staff to be promoted while working part time? And did, did you have to get university buy in or was it the norm already within the department? Yes. Um, so I think we were working around this before before we were even involved in Athena Swan. So so we began work back in about 2003. So that was several years before Athena Swan. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I actually don't know when our first part time academic was promoted. There certainly was a promotion of Lucy Carpenter, who I mentioned. She she had a period of maternity leave and then she was on part time working and she was promoted. I believe from lecture up to senior lecture that period of time. So, so it did happen before Athena Swan, but, but of course it's just become more common over time. And I think to me, this is one of the things that, that seems like such a success in the department is the way that the male staff have changed their behavior really over time. And they are starting to work part-time and you know, also then, because they see, I think that you can have a successful career and work part-time. Yeah, the university, I think is, you know, it lags where we are as a department. It's easier as a department if you have the staff on board, you can move more quickly. An institution is always going to be slower. But I think if the will is there, then, then it can be done. So, so certainly we've seen things really changing at an institutional level here over the last few years. 
Caroline, I'm just going to ask you my own question. Um, yeah, sure. Um, it's the final one, really. Apologies to, to everybody. There's, there's quite a number of questions here. But, you know, it's kind of rare that I speak to someone that has a gold, a gold award, you know. So mm -hmm. I suppose, you know, what sets you apart, do you think, from or how have you got to where you've gotten? Is there anything specific or is it a case of incremental change, do you think? I think leadership is really important and that's probably the big thing I'd say. So from, from the beginning, so back in 2003, we had a head of department, Professor Robin Perut, some of you might know, who is a really strong supporter of women in science. And I think if you have the leadership, it will bring the department with you. I think now the job is very easy because the whole department is just on board with um, the whole project really of gender equality and broader equality and diversity. We've just seen this being you know, something that we've been able to be a successful department around and everybody's working lives are better for it, I think is the reality. But but getting there, you need the leadership. That's the one big thing, I'd say. OK, Caroline, thank you very much. I found it I found it fascinating, just particularly the practicalities around all of this.